Hello. I hope that you've already watched David's video on utopia and dystopias. If you haven't, then you should right now. Well, <laughs> hopefully anybody who hadn't done that has now done it. So this video is going to be about Australian utopias and dystopias. How can they really be any different? Is there something distinctly Australian about certain hopes, fears, anxieties, or despairs that may come to pass? Today, I'm going to break this session into two broader discussions, one that focuses on Australian utopia and one on Australian dystopia. They ultimately come together more on the dystopic side of fiction, so their meeting points will also be discussed then. With regard to my knowledge of the history of Australian literature involving utopias, I must thank Andrew Milner and Verity Bergman for their exhaustive efforts in their journal article that addresses utopia and utopian studies in Australia. Without that, I don't think we could be doing such a good job of talking about Australian utopias. Australian utopias have particular focuses that are different than other utopic fiction. And that's because of some geographic features. Andrew Milner, who's writing alone in this situation, but one of these prominent scholars that I've been talking about, within the context of utopian studies scholarship in general, rightly points out how when we talk about Australian utopian fiction, usually we ignore something very prominent about Australia and it's also something we ignore in a lot of our Australian fiction, actually. It could come up in literally any of the genres we discuss in this course. And that, of course, is to the fact that Australia is an island. That's right. The idea that Australia is an island. Usually we think of Australia as a continent, right? And if we think of Australia as an island... Maybe that changes our perspective on what Australia can be. You see, the island evokes a certain kind of connotation. An island is isolated. It's cut off from the world when it comes to land. However, on the other hand, we might also think of an island not necessarily as this remote community, but rather as a community that's accessible on all sides. So it can be a transient space, or it can be an isolated one. Great. That's very helpful. Well, generally, we do think of islands as remote in the Anglophone imaginary. So we do have that. So long as there are the proper landings, maybe we could argue otherwise. But in this case, let's think about the isolated aspect of the Australian utopia. You see, the island itself is connected to a lot of colonial ideas and colonial legacies. Where did Christopher Columbus first land when he sailed the ocean blue in 1492? Well, he landed in the Bahamas. He landed in some Caribbean islands. With that in mind, it's very obvious that even the history of the novel is connected deeply with the island. Robinson Crusoe, what is widely considered by many to be the very first novel, is set on an island. But Australia is a bit of a special island, right? And islands are special in utopias in general. As David has talked about in the prior session that you've, you've listened to, the utopia, the first utopia when we think of, of utopia, the, the name is, of course, Thomas More's Utopia. And that, of course, takes place on an island. So an island has a certain connection to utopias. But in Australian utopias, it's especially prominent. Because, well, Australia is an island. But as an island, Australia is unique. It's very big. <laughs> so unlike stories about colonial islands, which certainly could have these maroon figures, whether it's a Crusoe or someone else, Australia's islands are vaster. The distance from Dublin to Moscow, a lot of you don't know, is actually shorter than the distance from Perth to Sydney. So imagine that. Imagine that vastness, it's bigger than what we consider the barriers of Europe. What that means is there's a whole lot more space on the page. 
both in the literal sense on the map, but also when we think about writing in fiction with regard to imagination. So much of Australia in its early Anglophone version of history was yet to be discovered. And so much of their early and some might argue present day national identity is tied to settler colonialism and exploring those missing places. Since it was so untouched by colonial powers, it was easy in early Australian history and even before its colonization to use it as a source of colonial fantasies. It was a blank slate to them to project their ideas upon, utopias and all. Its vast, not destroyed and, and not industrialized environmental biomes certainly were a shock to its first settlers and explorers from the Anglophone world. To them, the bounty of the land was ripe for the taking, and it was easy to project notions of colonial fantasies upon the outback and bush both as a source of yet unexplored and unexploited resources, and also as a sort of Garden of Eden, a promised land, a utopic, pre-humankind space. And this is, of course, because the Garden of Eden is a utopic vision of the future. Although most people think of it as the genesis, as the creation myth, it also parallels, thanks to the tireless work of Aaron Splup and Roland Bohr, historically it parallels actually a vision for the future. As Rohr writes, Eden is not so much a story of some ideal state in the past that is forever unattainable, but an image of the future for which we strive. And that's tied to the connection of the promised land and also the story of a new Jerusalem. All these justifications were pertinent and relevant to the utopian designs that colonizers were able to project as imperial desires onto the world, specifically the Australian world. These designs and the European settlers' assertion of their dominion over Australia as part and parcel to the fulfillment of these utopian projects are, of course, ridiculous as the indigenous people of Australia were already present. And their land remains marked with dystopia to this day. As Gabriella Coleman, the writer of Terra Nullius, stated in an interview with ABC, we don't have to imagine a dystopia. We live in one, day after day. Writers did have to imagine utopias, though and some of the earliest writings about Australia were before it was even colonized. Narratives like Gabriela de Foyne's La Terre Australa Canu and Vera's Histores de Savarambas, published in 1676 and 1677 respectively, are just a few examples where this is clear. And such utopic visions of Australia did not vanish even after Australia was no longer terra incognitae, when it was terra nullius. So we have some unifying concepts of the Australian utopia that show some semblance of divergence already. Surely there are other utopic stories where an explorer is marooned or lost and meets a civilization that lives within an isolated utopia, but rarely are they paired with the particular vastness that we talk about when we think of Australia. And when we think of those particular constellations, when we think of empty, isolated vastness, we can also turn to later fiction like Archbishop Richard Waitley's 1837 account of an expedition to the interior of New Holland, which has actually filled the, the Bathurst Plains with white settlers from a bygone era. The protagonist in that story meets up with descendants of 17th century English and German refugees, who, upon the arrival of this Australian criminal, Scott, they scoff at the idea and they're, they're very confused. They go, why are you sending, why is Europe sending these criminals to our land? And that kind of erasure of the Aboriginal Indigenous Australian people is very common in this time of writing. Another example of it is in the short story O'Adin, or The Mysteries of the Interior in Unveiled, which was written in 1847. In that case, the protagonist stumbles upon a lost civilization in Australia 
And of course, that lost civilization isn't the civilization that they're making lost at the same time, that they're turning into lost generations. Later, utopic novels that used empty space are novels like Robert Elias Dudgeon's Columbia from 1873 and Joseph Frazier's Melbourne's and Mars from 1889. At this point, they're moving away from the inland of Australia, but they're still maintaining this vast, open, and unexplored terrain. This remains important to these utopias. And they're still centered so often on privilege-based Australian or Eurocentric societies to fulfill their colonial fantasies. And this tradition continued. But as time went on, utopias were more and more displaced and supplanted by dystopias. According to Andrew Miller, by the 19th and 20th centuries, dystopias had effectively subsumed the position of utopian fiction, particularly after the end of World War II, when there's all these different cultural anxieties like nuclear warfare to worry about. But things weren't over for the utopian novel yet. Have no fear. As Milner, writing this time with Verity Nancy Bergman, noted the counterculture of the 1960s and 70s affected Australia in a significant way. But it wasn't a textual way. You see, attention and the discourse was shifted when it came to the utopia towards a form of intentional communities that had sprung up as resistance to the way things were run. And these cultures didn't fit the mold of these earlier colonial fantasies. Not exactly. They had different utopian ideas, and of course they carried parts of the colonial and, and Christian legacies with them. Certainly the Garden of Eden still evokes a certain ecological-oriented ideal. But it stepped beyond that and also moves towards certain progress initiatives that we might associate today with green politics. So at this time in the 60s and 70s, cli-fi types of discourses could be entering fiction, but they don't. However, these environmental and utopic ideas, they enter the mainstream of the culture, or at least a stream of the culture. And even in the 2000s, they're still there. There's over 100 communities in the north coast of New South Wales, according to one radio service, in the early 2000s. But it's been a while, you might say. And you're right. It's not the 1960s or the 70s anymore. It's been 50 or 60 years, depending on what we're talking about. And in literature today, especially in Australian literature, there is a steep emphasis on utopia that coexists alongside sustaining or resisting the dystopia. And importantly, there is a rich tradition that connects to these environmental utopias and dystopias. That's one of the reasons why these genres are necessarily alongside one another. We rarely see a completely pure dystopia or utopia in the traditional sense. You're not going to stumble across too many Australian utopias that don't have some kind of drawback, and you're not going to run into very many dystopias that don't have any good ideas mixed in. If we think of recent examples like Amberlynn Quemolina's The Interrogation of a Shayla Wolf, we see it clearly in the society built by the children, the tribe, who do not fit into their dystopia's notion of the balance, the ecological order, which nicely strikes a real chord with both the environmental dystopia and utopia. And it shows the, the liminal dangers of utopia and dystopia in an environmental sense in the first place. Another example is brought up by Bradford, Mallon, and Stevens in their discussion of the novel Boys of Blood and Bone by David Metzen then. And, of course, we could also look at Alan Van Nierven's Heat and Light because it also evokes similar problematics between what, what exactly a dystopian utopia could be. I would say that you probably, no matter what text you're reading for this session, it probably contains both utopic and dystopic elements, and most likely we'll find commonalities through our discussions of utopia and dystopia in the Australian context. Often, but not always, the utopia finds its way into dystopian novels. But I'm going to leave the rest of that notion to the second part of the lecture, which is coming up soon. What I want to stress again is how Australian utopias are unique or set apart from many other Anglophone traditions of utopia. First, as a post-colonial space, Australian utopias often have a connection to colonial fantasies. 
whether they are first encounters or invasion narratives or even hyper-racialized others. These ideas are unique to Australia and certainly unique to other places as well, but that narrows our scope of vision a bit. Secondly, Australian utopias make use of the Australian space. Relying on both the island qualities of Australia, its paradoxical isolation yet accessibility, coupled with the mystery and wonder that can be experienced in a blank canvas of a vast bush and outback. Of course, that carries certain colonial connotations, but this is something we can notice in our Australian utopic fiction. Thirdly, Australian utopias have an especially strong connection to ecotopias and the environment, and that's spurred on by these 60s and 70s national culture scenarios involving intentional communities, but it's also connected to that Garden of Eden Christendom idea, a paradise type of utopia. Of course, there's also a contemporary problem, too. The climate crisis adversely affects Australia greatly. Last year, and that was in 2019, their forests were burning and burning and burning, and it hit national news. It hit international news, I should say. So obviously, there's a connection there as well. So with that in mind, I want us to turn our attention to the Australian dystopia. Australian dystopias figure as the other side of this binary coin if we fail to account for the dynamism of these narratives. But thinking of dystopia in this way as a purely negative definition can be at least minorly useful if we want to think of the Australianness of its dystopias. Recall earlier in this video, and how I emphasized the island status of Australia, but also its vastness and thus its depth. An Australian dystopia novel necessarily can and often does incorporate elements of this isolation as well, either in its resistance or in its figuring of the dystopia itself. Let's take as an example the most seminal dystopia in all of Australian literary history up to this point. I'm of course talking about Neville Shute's On the Beach. It seems like an obvious example to those of us who've looked into this, but I'll give you a short summary because we can't expect you to have read everything already. On the Beach is about a world that was bad enough to be destroyed by nuclear warfare. It was written in 1957, so the fears of nuclear apocalypse were pretty high. However, what's important about On the Beach is that the setting stands out. It's set, at least initially, in Australia, and it centers on characters who are connected to Australia in some way or another. Australia is not eradicated in the nuclear exchanges between world powers. When World War III happens, Australia is still left standing. Perhaps curiously, and perhaps not so curiously, its island status facilitates it as one of the last vestiges of humanity. But the world is still dying. And that's because the nuclear winds, the product of this nuclear warfare, is spreading radiation increasingly south. So for the Australian characters, as well as the American ones in this story who are in Australia, this is an existential crisis that they must face. A life and death scenario. So On the Beach then explores a feudal struggle against this disastrous future. A disastrous future that's only possible because of Australia's position as an isolated and marginalized area of the map and as a global power. It is literally its marginal status then, along with South Africa, New Zealand, and the southernmost parts of South America, that lead to their continued doom in a scenario played out with much worse consequences and worse outcomes than that of nuclear detonation alone. Radiation poisoning is a slow and painful death, and On the Beach's struggle against the slow, fatalistic, and fatal decimation of their populations signals to the broader context of Australian isolation. There are some problems that cannot be isolated against. And this is a recurring theme in Australian dystopian fiction. If we pick apart those notions of vastness that I discussed earlier 
and we think of the vast shorelines of Australia, as well as its particular resonance with environmental issues, it comes as no surprise that the ecological dystopia is important to Australian literary fiction. James Bradley's Clade, Alex Wright's The Swan Book, George Turner's The Sea in the Summer, the film series Mad Max, and many, many more examples prove this point without a doubt. You'll notice a common strain to every novel that I've mentioned so far. They are connected deeply to the apocalypse and apocalyptic narratives. And that is the case for dystopia in much of recent literary fiction, and honestly, much of dystopia in general. Popular Anglophone examples that evoke this idea include the Hunger Games series, the Divergent series, Ling Ma's Severance, and many, many more countless examples, the Walking Dead television series among them. It is often that an apocalypse in one or another way has actually led directly to the dystopia as it is figured in a novel, or in a film, or in a TV series. But it is usually an apocalypse that is tied to the inability for a given society or culture to change. Dystopias function in this sense as a form of cultural critique, highlighting the dangerous outcomes that undergird some of the processes that shape our very worlds including many of our cultural and societal anxieties and fears. If Australian utopias, due to their relationship to European conventions and European ideas, connect to that Christian and Eurocentric notion of the Garden of Eden as a paradise to return to, then it only makes sense that a dystopia harkens to the Christian end times, the apocalypse, and afterwards. As Rosalind Weaver puts it, in one of her studies, Apocalypse in Australian Fiction and Film, a critical study, she argues that the most influential aspect on secular apocalyptic writing in Australia and in the Western context is the biblical apocalypse. Characteristic to the apocalypse is the idea of an antichrist-like figure one who leads and, and controls part of the world in what many people would consider a kind of dystopia. It also has this notion of survivors who live on after the greater apocalypse. And because of that, we can see how it easily connects to ideas of the apocalypse and dystopia, and how these ideas themselves are connected by the biblical accounts. Something I find quite intriguing in the Australian context is how often these are paired with ecological phenomenon. However, this is assuredly part of a context of contemporary anxiety. The Australian dystopia, according to Rosalind Weaver in Apocalypse in Australian Fiction and Film, has highlighted how these narratives, including dystopian narratives, revolve around a variety of problems, including the disastrous aftereffects of colonization, genetic tampering, ecological disasters, nuclear warfare, outback and bush nightmares, totalitarian regimes, and prison-themed narratives. What most of these have in common is, according to Weaver, a unique relationship to extinction and invasion, and that makes a lot of sense. If we look back at Australia's colonial history, it's obvious how extinction and invasion are connected to them. The ecological aspects of Australian dystopia are also at times directly connected to experience today that are the repercussions of colonial experience. As Andrew Milner wrote in an essay titled Changing the Climate and the Politics of Dystopia, a more contemporary Aboriginal tradition of dystopian writing about the world the Europeans made has emerged. And that's because they have been, they are, living in a dystopia, where holy sites are destroyed for mineral acquisition, where rights are trampled on and territories that are owned are discarded. Decisions like the Mabo decision are a hundred years too late, or more, and they themselves do not fulfill enough, perhaps. When Bradford, Mullen, and Stevens address dystopic fiction in Australia, they emphasize how dystopic regimes 
are usually related to oppositions created by settler society, including place versus landscape, origin versus belonging, inclusion versus exclusion, memory versus language, and repression versus resistance. Books like The Road to Winter by Mark Smith and Land of the Golden Clouds by Archie Weller demonstrate some of the intersections between these ideas and how they relate to both apocalypse and dystopia. You can also see with these two examples how topics like migrant fiction, ecological problems, fan the fantastic, and a host of other scenarios can come into contact within this generic field. Andrew Milner notes in this schemata, when we think of Australian science fiction, but also when we think of science fiction in general, the biggest difference between these two genres is actually the technology and science. They both offer us visions of the future, whether they are dystopic or utopic, or some kind of mixture of the two. And I think that transitions nicely into a discussion about where these two ideas meet. As I mentioned before, Bradford, Malin, and Stevens discuss a text that broaches both utopia and dystopia, David Metzenthen's Boys of Blood and Bone, and they do it in a striking way. They highlight how utopic memories fuel the response to dystopia. These utopic histories offer possible futures, undoing our conceptions of utopias only as far away impossibilities, and rooting them instead in what some might call nostalgic memories. By creating a new affiliation and connection between memories and possible futures, it suggests that there are ways to diverge or prevent dystopia already visible to us. In addition, they elaborate on how these memories, by their very presence, suggest that these traces can act as tracks towards a better society. This probably chimes well with our selected text. How does it compare? Veronica Kelly, in an article concerning drama entitled Apocalypse and After, dwells on how rendering history as dystopia or utopia, rather than just retaking history in our narratives, offers us a springboard for change. As Andrew Milner maintains, the whole point of utopia or dystopia is to acquire some positive or negative leverage on the present. And so the question might become, why not both? The reason we see utopias and dystopias coming together so often, especially in the Australian context, is because they are often bound together in the impossibilities of utopia. It seems really necessary and and probably necessary all the time, for subjects to be caught up in lives that include both hope and despair. And so an idea of a world without despair strikes us as impossible, or at least implausible. On the other hand, a dystopia that ends in total eradication, like on the beach, still contains hope as the primary element of resistance against fates, even if they end in utter destruction. When we read the interrogation of a Shayla Wolf, by Ambeline Quimelina, we have the juxtaposition between horrors in the bush, in the form of creatures we may term monsters, the sores, and the utopic vision of the tribe. If we read a text like The Subjugate by Amanda Bridgman, we need to face a world that has turned prisons into the ultimate pacification of some of the most dangerous criminals, all while it also turns its wardens into murderers. Whether highlighting aspects of Australia's history, like colonial prison colonies in the subjugate, or reconstituting society after ecological collapse in the interrogation of a Shayla Wolf, Australian dystopias and utopias have a tendency of coming together and realizing some of their most unique aspects together. With that in mind, I'm going to wrap up this video, but I want to remind you of four takeaways from the dystopian section of this video. One, I want you to think about how the use of islands in space is similar to utopic Australian works, and how they may even relate to colonial histories. Secondly, I want you to think about the more powerful and stronger emphasis on eco-critical uh, readings and concepts 
when it comes to the dystopia. Although we have some utopic visions of the environment, in sheer volume the dystopic ones are more present and that obviously relates to how climate change adversely affects Australia in contemporary work. Third, I want you to think about the relationship between apocalypse and dystopia in Australian writing. This is certainly a common thread in a lot of Anglophone work, but it's something to consider and think about your whole concept of dystopia and how it can relate to the apocalypse, and perhaps we have other notions of apocalypse than just Christian ones in our Australian texts. Finally, I want you to think about the way that dystopia and utopia synthesize and work together by creating both positive and negative leverages for visions of the future. I believe the next video that you're going to be watching will deal with our primary texts, and I hope that I've given you a good way and springboard to enter that text. Thank you very much for your attention.